Hello and welcome to an episode of the 905er and we're going to do a uh, 905 roundup uh, this week. Um, we haven't done one in a while so we thought we'd cover a couple of stories that that um, we haven't covered elsewhere, some things that are happening um, in the province um, and some stories that kind of got by us for various reasons that we'll explain when we get to that part of the story. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, not not for one to trying, I think is 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 the first uh, uh, part of that. Um, so this week, anyway, uh, the provincial government, led by Mr. Doug Ford, had a shuffle, um, perhaps feeding into the rumours that we're heading for a for an early election, um, or who knows? Well, Joel, what did uh, what did you make of the of the shuffle? Uh, well, I think uh, a few a few notes on it uh should be pointed out that we had a uh, on the on the podcast when we we're covering the milton by-election we had on laura steiner of the milton reporter and she had mentioned that she was hearing rumors that post the by-election there would be a, a cabinet shuffle and she heard she heard rumors that possibly uh z hamid might get uh uh into cabinet that way that didn't, turned out not to be true that didn't work out for whatever reason but i do i do think credit should be given to the fact that Laura, the, at least the fact that she heard rumor of a cabinet shuffle was imminent post by election, that was true. So kudos to Laura for uh, for 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 getting that to us. Um, that being said, though, I think overall the cabinet shuffle seems a little. It, it's it's kind of just like shuffling a deck of cards. I don't I don't really see like there's any strategy here other than, I think the biggest one was the shift out of education of Minister Stephen Lecce from education to energy and that's you and i have talked that seemed to be a, a big red flag of our previous story with sabrina nanji that we might be heading to a early election here in ontario uh mostly the fact that i th i think the fact that they want it, they want to keep lecce in government they want to give him uh a lot of of uh uh prominence in the party and a lot of it is also to give him a chance to get some deep donor pockets coming into that that uh coffer going into it i would say you know maybe a 2025 early election yeah so i mean basically it was a straight swap which is unusual it was a straight swap with with todd smith who was the uh energy minister um uh and and let she with smith going to education and let she go into energy and um, Todd Smith is, is one of those names that um, he's been around for a while in senior positions, apparently even thought about running for the leadership at one point. But I think you'd struggle to find many people in Ontario who have a clue who Todd Smith is. Um, uh, and that may be with reason. That may be why he's now education minister and, and why Lecce is, is now at Energy. Energy is definitely a, a ministry that, gets given you no know, it's another this is a sideways move it's not a demotion or a promotion for anybody um let has been in education for a long time um it's not a ministry that anybody gets left in forever uh you, it's like your reward for doing a good job at education is to get moved out of education yes um you know it can be a real poison chalice um uh let has been there for six years which is a long time um by the standards of that position um i guess they think he did a good job i think you'd find an awful lot of teachers who disagreed but um you know i guess that's traditional well, i think that's a, that was a, his role in education if you think about it was um uh, it's no it's no, no uh, misunderstanding that the ontario pc party does not like the teachers unions they are not of all the unions in this province that they're eager to get buddy buddy with the teachers unions are the last on the list on the list and same i think the feeling is mutual from the teachers unions towards the ontario pc party that being said though um if you remember way back folks when the tories first got elected in in ontario um they try to be you know hammered home to the teachers and we got this rotating strike system just prior to the pandemic um in fact the pandemic is what ended the strike system because uh, we all had to stay home so i think they learned their lesson from it saying okay clearly like the the teachers have a, a 
a system that they can really kind of screw us over here and they're not really going to lose they can they can hold out uh, with parent support and t- and student support for a longer time than we can and so the mission was on Lecce to say okay you got to get the a, a deal in place and avoid strikes at all costs which like it or not folks i think Lecce achieved that mission uh it kind of, well, he achieved it i mean coincidentally the day he got demoted uh, not demoted sorry the day he got shuffled to energy it's the same day that the teachers across the province have received large checks in their pay packets um for for back pay for the money that the province was trying not to pay to teachers that that they lost um mm-hmm. that they were told by the courts yes no you have to pay this money so you know i i think you're right is his 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 credit within the party still runs high otherwise he wouldn't be going to energy however if you look at his legacy at education a as a progressive kind of person i think what they've been doing to education is appalling and terrible and absolutely a worse system today than it was when they came in but that's to be expected i suppose but in terms of what he tried to achieve he tried to achieve um lower salaries lost uh the unions one and um, you remember the unions forcing that u-turn by doug ford on the um on the issue of uh, um, the, uh, I can't remember what it was now. It was the 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 um, uh, uh, the notwithstanding clause issue. Uh, a couple right, of years that, ago. that was towards the 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 support staff in in schools with QP. Yeah. But you're right. I mean that that got oh, the right, teachers yeah. were very much up in arms about that to say like yeah. they could be coming for us next. They lost there. The, the mm-hmm. teachers have just got a. Again, they would say uh, absolutely no more than they were due. But in terms of what the, the province was, was was trying to get out of the teachers, they kind of lost. Um, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, if you, if you really if you really thought this government was going to take it to the teachers unions, then and Lecce was going to be at the forefront of that, then he failed. Um, mm-hmm. Unions are right where they were before. Um, every battle that they were defeated in. Um, and we have a legacy of you know worse relations between uh, schools and the government and, and of ineffective communication with the ministry itself. I remember talking to um, uh, oh today is not the day for me remembering names, people, <laughs> but uh, as a school trustee, uh, former chair of the Horton board, um, uh, talking about the kind of way in which. Um, the province communicated with with the boards and how kind of pathetically ineffectual that was um um so you know not a great legacy however he still seems to be the favored person within the, within the party so off to off to energy he goes um but where he can a... spend the summer on the rubber chicken chicken circuit shaking hands with with um well, that... private energy companies but that that's it right like the... If you think about it, like prior energy, the energy file has pretty much been established. What the conservatives want to go forward a lot on nuclear energy, which is, I give them credit. I, I come, I'm agreeing with their 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 position on that. I think we need nuclear energy is abundantly safer. It's greener. It's a and we we need it in this province. Um, so I'll give the Tories credit that yeah, we need a, a plan to develop nuclear energy within the province. Um. But that that those that framework and those deals have already kind of been uh, uh, done. I don't really know like what new projects or what what new policies Lecce's going to have to bring in, other than kind of maintain the status quo. What I do think it gives them an option to do is you're right, spend the summer doing the barbecue circuit, the rubber chicken circuit, um, all that, and going to smooth with the the deep pockets that are within the energy sector in Ontario. And say cough up some uh, some money to me because I'm the new energy minister and I can uh, you know I can decide whether or not you get a slice of the pie or if I get mm-hmm. if you uh, if you if your new big project can be the cash cow you hope it to be and that's what I suspect that this is, is that they want to keep Lecce uh, in in good standing within the party he's kind of I think seen as the future of the the Ontario PCs whenever Doug Ford does step down. Uh, and that this gives them a chance to kind of build some bona fides with the deep pot. Again, 
the deep pocket corporate donors that the Tory government relies on. Yeah, and and I think you know Todd Smith going in the opposite direction is like, well, here's a guy who doesn't rock the boat. I mean, this may be perhaps a good thing from the perspective of of the schools and the teachers that they're putting in a guy who is not some kind of ideological maniac. Um, maybe he'll just let them get on with doing their jobs rather than you know mm-hmm. being a jerk. Um, uh, you know. Someone who's managed to hold multiple high positions within the government and never get noticed, I tend to think that's a good thing for for for, for the other folk who have to work with them. You know, um, nothing more nothing more uh, annoying than an ambitious politician in your ministry. Um, so, this is maybe a good thing for, for, from from that point of view. I mean, the other thing I guess in the in in the uh, shuffle we should mention is that Steve Clark's back in. Uh, having you know taken his slap on the wrist after the um, green belt scandal, um, you know back back you know it, it was a it's a sorry not sorry kind of firing you know right um, it's like oh go sit on the back benches for six months and we'll, well find you and let's be honest with it was somewhere else it was okay if I punish you for six months the story goes away and we can get back to to business which kind of seems to have worked. Like we don't talk with the green belt anymore. They, the, you know, Todd Smith fell on his sword. He's the, he's the person who, who they're going to basically say he's responsible for it, but he's learned his lesson and he gets to go come back into the, uh, the big six figure uh, top job in the, in the, in the government coffers or uh, 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 ministries, not ministry, uh, cabinet now, mm-hmm. which is another thing I want to, I think should be noted is the Ontario government now has the largest cabinet, I think, in the history of Ontario. This, I've said it before. Like this is, I, I am tired of the hypocrisy of the conservatives on this whole. Like, oh, we're we're the best uh, hands on the wheel. We're the you know we're the stewards of fiscal good fiscal management, and we're you know it's time that you have the freedom to maintain. Your, your, you know, the government is too big; it needs to be reined in. We need to cut back on public spending. And here's Doug Ford with a record number of parliamentary assistants, record number of minister, cabinet ministers, all getting top dollar paycheck increases on top of their normal MPP salaries for a minute, like a minute, like things like Ministry of Red Tape Reduction. What is this? Like, you need an entire ministry to do this. This is a ridiculous uh ministry that they that they have that i'm like the, the, but and we we're, we're told that oh the ontario pcs they're the ones who best know how to manage the till we are at record uh government spending you know for just if just in terms of ministers uh and mpp salaries uh what what happened to doug ford of oh i'm, I'm a good i'm gonna reduce the 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 expenditures and rein in government spending and, and shrink the size of government so it's more manageable and more effective for you know the great ROI on on the public taxpayer. Wow. You know, balance, balance the, taxpayer. the budget. Uh, balance oh, the budget. Oh, that, I guess, pay down the deficit. All this stuff gets forgotten because, in all God's honest truth, it's not actually what matters about running the province. But the thing is, it's the hypocrisy. Oh, the massive hypocrisy of them banging on about it for decades while that while the Liberals were in government. And then the minute they get in, they do the same damn stuff. But worse, I mean, I mean, the the thing about the ministries thing, like I will accept completely that governments use ministries as particularly again coming up to an election. It's like you want to raise the profile of some people in some marginal seats or some some new MPs, MPPs who you know, need to kind of get noticed when when they're running for election. Well, you stick them into a ministry for six months before the election, and you know maybe that will right. that will tip the balance. Um, get as many people into ministries as possible, so that they you know not only can they get the salary. Um, so basically, now everybody in the PC caucus, pretty much, with maybe the exception of the the two newbies, is uh, is getting ministry level salaries of some kind. Um, you know, it's. it's it's really, again, hypocrisy of it. 
is, I, I is, just... it's outstanding that you can't you don't even pretend to keep it the same as the previous guys or to reduce it by one or two. Oh no, no, we'll just bust through the limits that they they had. The what gets me is, and this is uh, con, this is conservative, uh, small c conservative thinking because this happens every time around the world. You, you show me a conservative minded right wing government that takes power anywhere in the world, they always run on this promise: government spending is out of control. Uh, taxation is is run amok. Those those tax and spend liberals. We need to come in, right the boat, uh, right the ship. We need to to rein in spending, cut, 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 um, because it's just wasteful spending. And the public buys it. They buy it and they say, okay, we're going to vote in this new conservative, small c conservative minded right wing government who's going to be fiscally prudent and 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 good stewards of the public coffers, and they're going to right the ship. And what happens? Every single time, regardless of consequences, regardless of principle, every single time, by the time that government leaves office, the debt is gigantic compared to when they took office. Government spending is run amok. There's so much waste and just no discipline with the public coffers. Every single time, Republicans, uh, British Tories, here in Canada, federal Tories, provincial Tories, it is the same they get elected, they run on the principle and the promise to the public of they're going to rein in spending, they're going to cut taxes uh, uh, for us, but they're going to cut spending and they're going to rein it in and they're going to have be more disciplined with the public coffers than those those dreaded lefty, left-leaning governments that are just so spending and wasteful and whatever, blah, 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 blah. And no matter what, by the time they take office, by the time they leave office, the situation is far worse. The coffers are depleted. We are, we don't have the money to rebuild badly needed uh, programs or services, and it's just it's it's a tried and true test. But and I'm, my question isn't oh how dare those conservatives how dare they and 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 they're doing they they are doing what they do best. They just want the power. They just want the power of government, and we always fall for it. The public always uh, falls for it. And I think there was a time when conservative governments were slightly more slightly more genuinely what they claimed to be, as in terms of stewards of the, you know, fiscal stewards and blah, blah, blah. Slightly more. I don't think there was ever a time when they were perfect, but they were slightly more responsible. Now, modern conservatism, it seems to me, is it's very it's shades of a of a grift. It it's just mm -hmm. it's purely you know look at Doug Ford's government. What 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 is the driving? What is at the heart of his government? What is its purpose? What is it really trying to do? And it boils right down to it. And it's like line the pockets of business people to yeah. make a few people enormously wealthy and screw yeah. everybody else. Well, that's uh, just saying, like, any any programs to help. The marginalized, the poor ODSP, right? ODSP in this province is a part of my French folks. A fucking joke. Uh, we had the people who who you think that's what government should be for to help people who genuinely need it, people who have a developmental uh, uh, delayed issue or development issue, who they can't. It's not a matter of just go get a job, go go better yourself. They literally can't. They, they through no fault of their own. And we we throw pennies at them, throw pennies at them, and say, "Pick up your socks or pick yourself up by your by your by your bootstraps." And it's like, how fucking cruel are we? But yeah, we'll, we'll go out of our way to say, "Okay, a developer wants to buy land around the green belt. Well, we'll find a way to make that happen." Okay, great. We're going to go uh, cozy up to uh, big union bosses and build for them training centers across the province because well they can go and 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 you know union bosses aren't hurt aren't hurting in this province but we'll go and give them what they want but the the poorest of the poor we have homeless people in every city and we're saying and we said to them, well just you know pick up your bootstraps get sort out yourselves well, and, like, and here's, that's a, so here's, things... bucks, here's 200 bucks a month or, or 700 bucks a month and that's going to solve your your problems in the 905 or elsewhere in ontario it's like you you that's it's gotten to the point of just bad policy to the point of abject cruelty, in my opinion, to do this to the people who they're not. It it, it it's it's just it's cruel, and I I there's no justification for it. 
liberal or conservative, the, the fact that it's this bad, but the conservatives are, the, are in the driving seat right now. So they get the uh, the brunt of my wrath, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's not pretend that it was perfect under any other previous government. I mean, I think you and I would both feel that, you know, we can't keep on repeating the mistakes of the past and just retreading the same thing. So the liberals get in, in and raise ODSP by a percentage point or two. It's like, mm -hmm. no, how do we get to the root of these problems? How do we, how do we stop? just being how do we have different degree you know different degrees of failure um let's actually try and succeed you know yeah uh, but yeah th th this is this is this is modern government it, it seems that that it's just a catalog of disappointments and i can't help feeling that if we were a, a more economically literate people Basically, we elect governments on the basis that you run the province like you run family accounts. And so you've got to keep your credit card low and you've got to pay off your credit card. And ideally, you won't have a credit card at all, though we all do. So we're all hypocrites too. Mm -hmm. Oops, stuff falling off my walls here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, And actually, that's not how the economy, you go and look, you talk to, you know, real top class economists like no, that's not how it works you know, the, the american the u.s budget through its well let's not talk about it now when it's when it's you know bordering on a failed state but let's talk about uh, the usa during its, its its period of greatest glory massive government debt never a balanced budget it doesn't actually matter it's about how much is your debt costing you uh, and can you service that debt uh, you know, it doesn't work like family accounts. This thing, well, it, this thing that we run the province like we've run our family accounts is just not sensible. It's not true. It's a lie. So they come in, they do that, and you waste basically waste time mm -hmm. trying to achieve objectives that don't actually make any sense to achieve. Well, that's um, just it. Well, we, and then we, we like we we spend more on things like right. uh, you know, supporting people who have illnesses or, or disabilities because we don't fund them properly through ODSP. Therefore we pay more in other areas because you know, people living on the street are very expensive to, because of the damage they cause yeah. because of the harm they do to the local economy for all these reasons. Like, you know, it's bad economically. It's a bad decision to, to, to let that kind of situation continue uh, from a purely kind of, selfish point of view you want but, to get homeless people off the streets but we we get yeah. into this but that's what the conservatives run on and, I, and I'm, again i'm not talking just the ontario pcs i think it's a conservative philosophy of just we can sell this lie or worse yet they actually believe it they believe oh well i'm just but that's kind of explains why when conservative governments get into power it's a slash you know let's slash every service across the board right let's slash education let's slash health care Let's slash, let, we don't really need to slash ODSP, but, you know, they, they pr came in and promised, oh, we're going to fix the autism file. We're going to, we're going to get the, the treatment that families with autism, uh, children who, who have autism need, and we're going to get that done. Well, the, the solution was just, we'll cut you a check. We'll, we'll give you $50,000, figure out how to, how to make that work. Our, we're done here. And they shuffle, they shake their hands and walk away. And it's just, again, it's just like, no, the, the idea of just, Let's cut back on everything until the the balance, the budget reaches zero. Well, the problem is that the and this is what the previous liberal government did after Ernie Eves and Mike Harris took power. They realized, oh my God, like the the these programs that stood the test of time are now Swiss cheese. They're it's like termites took to them. There's no there's no support for them. And they the McGinty and Wynn liberals kind of spent time trying to build to rebuild it. Did they work fast enough? Probably not. In hindsight, they, they probably took their time or they were afraid of uh, rocking the boat too much. But my thing is, uh, yeah. well, my thing is that eventually the Tories will be, will lose power. Like that's just what happens. At that point, whoever takes over, whether it's the NDP or the Liberals, I'm not sure it'll be Mayor Stiles or Bonnie Crombie, truth be told, but who knows? But at some point, the Liberals or the NDP will form a government. And that government can't keep doing things the way it is. They're going to be forced to make drastic changes. Um, 
you know, they're, 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 it's going to be in the inevitable, in my opinion. But you're right. Like this, yeah, this idea of just, oh, well, let's just keep slashing until the budget, you know, we can balance the budget. It doesn't seem to work. Because the other thing is you cut out, you're cutting away. It's like trying to balance your budget by taking a pay cut. It's like saying, well, I'm going to balance the budget by saying, well, I'm going to, you know what? Don't pay me 60 grand a year. Pay me 30. Because that's what tax cuts do. Well, yeah, and and every time the government cuts spending, you're cutting money out of the economy. Um, you know, what did we do to get out of the 2008 financial crisis? Yeah, we could have taken the approach they took in the 1930s, which was to, you know, basically, well, just suck it up until it goes away of its own accord. Mm -hmm. But rather than do that, we actually did something that uh, a... Labour Party member from Britain, uh, who was the the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, uh, came up with first that the rest of the world basically copied, which is like, spend your way out of a financial crisis. Make sure people are still employed. Make sure invest in 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 building. You know, remember all those yeah. those those blue uh, signs from from Stephen Harper. Um, you know, it's like spend your way out of a crisis, and it worked. So sure, we added money to deficits and all those things, but it was worth it, particularly in an age of, of, of very low inflation. Yeah. You know, we're not quite in a situation of as low inflation now, but it's still from a historic perspective, not particularly high. It often makes sense to go into debt um, to keep the, the province or the country going. Uh, and if you just say, well, we're in debt, therefore we cut our spending like you do in your home economics, um, then you're not just you know basically you're taking you're shrinking the economy as a whole you're taking money that people yeah. need to earn and to fund other jobs you know, that cycle that kind of virtuous circle of money from government to people to government to people and you're closing that down and so it you know you're you're taking away the means of generating money you're not you know you know it's not that simple it's like, Cut ten dollars here. That's ten dollars safe. That's not how it works. Well, what gets me is just the the hypocrisy of it all. Coming back to this cabinet shuffle, of oh, we need to rein in spending, rein in spending. Yet you're giving. Well, they can't. Yeah, they can't just can rein like, it in, in their own cabinet. You, like you're 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 spending like a drunken sailor on your own cabinet. It's like you know, hey, you want a cabinet position? You get one. You get one. You get one. I mean, if I I'll be honest, if I was like Z Hamid from Milton recently elected, like where's my cabinet? You know. Yeah. Where, where, uh, where, I didn't where, even where, get. I didn't get to be an assistant. I didn't even get. Yeah, it's like wherever he's an assistant. I mean, the, yeah. the, the guy in the back benches who can't stay awake. Um, you know, the the nine hundred year old MP MPP from wherever who can barely walk and chew at the same time. He'll be an assistant or something. You know. So right. yeah, I mean, it's. And, and this isn't you. Other governments did this. You know, the, the minister for seniors under the liberals was just some old bloke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, um, but that's what you do, right? Uh, so it's just not new. But the thing is, if you come in saying, if you come in saying, you know, we're, we're going to be efficient and lean and blah, blah, we're going to get rid of all this waste, then you can't then you know, have the fattest, most bloated cabinet in oh, the yeah, history yeah. of the province. Yeah, and most of these people are complete non-entities. You go through the, you know, the reason we've talked about Lecce and we've talked about uh, Clark is because at least we've heard of them. Most of these other people are like, who? Yeah. And they've yeah. been there for, for six, 12 years now. Uh, well, certainly six years for most of them. And it's like, who? Yeah. Complete nobodies. Uh, but what gets me is like the, minister, the Minister of Transportation, uh, <sighs> nobody knows who, who he is. Yet everybody knows about the Highway 413 because it's Doug Ford's baby. Like he he wants to yeah. own that. What gets me is like, like who who's the minister of like red tape reduction? I'm not going to say it because it doesn't matter. Go look it up, people. It's a it's a useless position. It doesn't mean squat. Other than I get to get a six figure job, I get a cabinet uh, limousine to drive me around in, and I can probably find somebody to. Uh, to get a cut, you know, get a donor's a couple of hundred bucks on a on a barbecue circuit for my uh, for my coffers. That's that's what all this is about. It's just I th I think coming back to it is 
where they're spending the government, the taxpayers' dollar to give their people a raise to go into the summer circuit, which by the way, um, they're not coming back till October. So we have like the grandest break ever <laughs> for this. Uh, you know, we're again, we're, we're, I, we're, we're been... monitoring the taxpayers' money, but we're going to take the longest break uh, in recent history. I yeah. don't know if it's the, in Ontario history, but coming back October nineteenth, I believe, is when the legislature sits again. Yeah, and again, and... I wouldn't particularly care, but for one thing, I mean, it's it's a myth that the house being in session means that MPPs are working. That's a myth. And that if the, the house isn't in session, they're just sitting at home doing nothing. That's, we know that's a myth, right? Most of their work is nothing to do with the house. Um, the backbenchers have their stuff to do, which is mainly outside the house. The ministers certainly have plenty of stuff to be getting on with. That is nothing to do with the house. So we know that's a myth. So yeah, it kind of doesn't matter, but you know, that every time the Liberals called a called a, a recess uh, or, or broke for the summer or whatever, there was this oh, lazy, wah, 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 disgrace, disgrace, disgrace. So again, it's the fucking hypocrisy of it. Well, it's like, like I said, not only are you calling a long break, but the longest break. Yeah, you know, well, like, like, here's the other on. thing: it's, it's a political, it's a political move. You're right. I mean, the ministers will will be going to meet with stakeholders, and and their staff will be trying to come up with policy or whatever have you. That's going to happen. Uh, behind the scenes um but what gets me is this is political and again it's leading into that notion of we're going to an early election because you're taking away the summer and fall from the liberals right now bonnie crombie uh is not a sitting member right she can't get in front it's harder for her to get in front of the of the press to make a point to to say anything she's been great to go into the press gallery but here's the thing that press gallery is pretty much done for the summer they're they're going to go follow the barbecue circuit they're not sitting there like oh bonnie crombie has something to say let's go down to the press gallery and sit and and ask questions bonnie crombie has been doing that same as merit styles for the last little while this break kills that there's just gonna be nothing but doug ford and Stephen Lecce and Todd Smith and, and Sylvia Jones making announcements and 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 shaking hands and oh we're making this grand announcement but up but up but and there's not it's harder for the opposition parties to criticize or to go to the microphone and, and it also I mean in term and sorry in terms of the the sort of idea of an early election it also suggests that they're kind of done with legislation they're done with yeah. actual business that does have to go through the house that their agenda is complete now it's now it's the well, uh, say build up the coffers. The coffers are already full. Let's face it. Um, and to an extent, the only mistake may be giving the the opposition parties more time to do some fundraising. But I don't really think that. Well, I, I think services are so far ahead; it doesn't really matter. Well, that's the thing. Like it, it's it, at this point, they're not even looking at the election. I think they're looking at legacy building. They're looking at like Doug Ford's thinking. I want to step. I want to walk away at some point so I can go to hang out in Muskoka. Uh, on the on the snowmobile trails up there, but I think he's thinking, okay, I need to hand this off to somebody. And I'm, my bet is, it looks like he he's wants Lecce to be at the top of that list, that short list of potential leaders. And that's what this is about: is about giving him a chance to make a name in another ministry, build up some connections to big donors around the province. And build a and he's Doug Ford has talked openly about he returning Ontario to a Tory dynasty legacy that the Tory when the Tories had a streak of like fifty or sixty years of uninterrupted stewardship of Ontario, he wants to return it to that. And right now, I'm thinking, I don't see how that's not going to happen. I really don't. I don't see the the opposition getting to get like the Liberals need to rebuild their entire fundraising apparatus. From what I've seen, the liberals are not fundraising like they they thought they would, um, and that's the thing. It's like if Lecce goes into all these big pocket energy business donors, they're more likely to give money to him as oh he's the future potential premier of the province. I'm going to give money to him. Are they going to worry about giving money to Bonnie Crombie? No, Merritt Styles for sure not. She's probably not even knocking on their doors. So. I I I'm I'm I am the the idea that there's going to be an early election 
I think is very, very likely now. I well, think. And I definitely think that preying on their mind. I'm not sure how true it is, but certainly the the, the well, factually, it's true. The province and the and and the and the go and the country tend to go in opposite ways. The reasons for that, whether whether it's the people consciously think, I don't think they necessarily consciously think, oh, we've got the feds in Ottawa, therefore we'll have PCs here. I don't think it's that simple. However, I do think that a government of the supreme intellect of Doug Ford thinks, oh, tradition yeah. is, and it looks like Trudeau's out. We're going to have a conservative. We need to be first. We need to win. We need to be first because if we're not, they yeah. might go the other way. And um, I totally buy and, that. And to, to some, I mean, actually, that's not from taking politics out of it, taking personal opinions out of it. It's maybe not a bad calculation to be first. Uh, but I mean, you could talk about the fact that we have this fixed election law. What a what a joke that is. But I mean, you, you can't. I could go on about can't I, fit a fixed election law onto I think, I think our we, parliamentary we, system. There. I think we've uh, covered this as, as much as we can, given what we know yeah. uh, of what's going on. But um, I, I I would not put it past uh, an early election in Ontario now. I think we're going to hear a lot more uh, posi positioning and a lot more whatever successes Doug Ford and the Ontario PCs have had. We're going to hear more about it uh, in the next year i suspect uh we'll see how that that unfolds um so moving on there was one other story that we we were wanting to talk about for a while and we were trying to get people to come on and speak and nobody wanted to go on the record to talk about it but we thought it was really important uh because it seemed to us that there's a spark of rebellion in the 905 uh more particularly in our back our literal backyard here in Burlington, where a few weeks ago, I think it's months ago now, uh, basically council openly kind of re I don't, rebelled. I was going to say revolted, but that that sounded <laughs> a little bit too personal. Rebelled against Mayor Marianne Mead Ward. Uh, basically, because Marianne Mead Ward has, has Doug Ford's strong mayor's powers conferred to her. Um. And the council was saying, no, we, we need some of those those powers tamped back, uh, given back to the council. And they asked the mayor to, through bylaws, to, to legislate it back. That didn't happen. Uh, mayor Marianne Meadward still retains her strong mayor's powers in their totality. But it seems to us that Burlington City Council is not really happy with this new status quo. Now, we heard about this because uh, the good people at BurlingtonToday.com reported on it. Uh, we've seen posts by Lisa, uh, Councillor Lisa Kearns, uh, Councillor uh, Kevin Galbraith, and Councillor Shauna Stolte, basically espousing that they're concerned about this uh, uh, concentration of power in the mayor's office. And they had wanted to see, they, they were kind of pushing for this. We reached out to the three of them to have them onto the podcast. None of them responded back. Uh, at at all, uh, I don't know if that's a slight on us, but we've had a couple of them on before to talk, but they didn't want to talk about this, which seemed to us to be a really important story about kind of municipal governance and how this is how how it's shaping up to be in the Ontario PC Doug Ford era of Ontario. Um, I've talked enough about this, Roland. What what were your thoughts about this? Uh, my thoughts are mainly, well, it's really interesting. Uh, and, and I, I want to say, you know, we wanted to talk about this at the time it was happening. I mean, it was this is back in April to May that this this was going down. And we wanted to do a full episode on it. And we, we couldn't get the people to talk about it. So we're talking about it kind of late now, um, which is a shame because it was an important story. But, you know, we we, we had other episodes to do and we had speakers so you know i mean i guess this is how politicians control the agenda right by refusing to speak to you but um anyway, i want to point out that the, the many councillors on burlington and the mayor have spoken to us in the past and i thank them for that so and i'm sure they will again in the future they have their reasons but you know it's a shame 
Um, and I want to mention the Bay Observer as well for doing some good um, uh, pieces on on, uh, on this whole thing. Um, the most interesting thing of all is who was involved in this sort of mini rebellion. I believe even mini rebellion. It was quite a big rebellion actually, um, because of what what it says about Burlington Council. And uh, you know, I've said numerous times over the years that Marianne Mead Ward is a kind of extraordinary person. Um, extraordinary in her ability to provoke rage and fury in everybody eventually. Um, so the people who were at the forefront of this kind of rebellion were her allies as recently as two years ago, some of her strongest allies. Um, Shauna Stolte in the previous go round of, of council was kind of almost a lone voice um, uh, and sort of suffered consequences for speaking out on some issues against the mayor and kind of felt like, you know, a, a sort of um, gang kneecapping uh, to an extent, sort of bring her back into line at the end of the, the last council. And the people, um, Rory Nissan was particularly noted as kind of being the mayor's right hand person. Uh, um, Kelvin Galbraith to a, to a lesser extent also they now are on the side of the kind of rebels telling the mayor to hand over hand back power to them um, Kelvin Galbraith, Roy Nissan, Shauna Stolte, Lisa Kearns uh, these four um, the, I, I would say without fear of contradiction really four of the smarter members of the council um, everybody thinks Paul Sharman is a, is a genius particularly poor shaman <laughs> but um but yeah irony of ironies do you know who marianne meads ward's closest ally is today on that council who is she most buddy buddy with paul shaman paul shaman who used to well the suspicion was let's just say the suspicion was that paul shaman was behind you know leaks back in 2018 uh aimed at discrediting marianne mead ward you know of of really throwing her under the bus and saying what a dreadful person she was. He is now her closest ally. And the people who previously were her allies are now lined up against her. It's a very strange business, but it, it's utterly in character with Marianne Mead Ward's political career thus far. She creates enemies left and right. Um, so currently she's left with Angelo Bentevenia, who's kind of... The, the most uncontroversial member of, of the council, shall we say, and Paul Sharman as her allies, um, uh, the, what's, you know, the most right wing of, of the oh. of council as well. What would strange days we have? The most pro-development members of council are now her allies. Isn't that strange? You know? Well, I find, I mean, that's, that's, that's all interesting, but I find, I, I thought the story was more compelling in the, again, stepping back to the wider aspect of Ontario as a whole, is that we knew that this was happening when Doug Ford brought in the strong mayor's powers, when he first announced that this was going to be a reality. We were, we, you and I were kind of like waiting to see where would where would the first rebellion happen? Where, where would the first instance of the city council saying, no, we do not like this. How dare you, the mayor, the mayor uh, needs to be checked uh, in, in this potential abuse of power. And we were surprised. Oh wow, it's happening in in Burlington, like the, this, and it was open too. This is this is thing. We're not talking rumors here. This is all factual on the record. Uh, city council chambers recorded minutes, kind of stuff. We said that 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 should take note. What got us was that how quickly councils councilors just kind of mum, kept mum. Um, I, I thought that this, if this was really important, if the, if the idea, the the, the the allegation was that it's the basic demo, democratic principles. These people are elected to represent their wards on a, on a municipal council. And basically this strong mayor's powers neuters them. It, it, it strips away any power that they might have to advocate for the concerns or needs of their particular wards. And basically gives the mayor, and, it's, and I'm using this as gener generically. It's not just a, it's not that Marion Mead Ward is abusing the power. That's not the accusation here. Uh, to my knowledge, Marion Mead Ward has not done anything 
controversial or really wrong with the powers that we know of. Um, but it's just the principle of the matter of this is democracy. Like you elect people to represent the needs and the ideas that they come together to make decisions for the whole. And we we make it we make it work through compromise and negotiation. That goes away in the strong mayor's power uh, legislation. It basically, we just say no. The mayor is the only one who's accountable, and through the legislation, basically accountable to the uh, to the Ontario government. And this was what we want to talk about with the with the council. It's just like, is is this just a nail in the coffin of democratic principles at the municipal level? Like, what what point is it having municipal governments anymore? If really. It's just the mayor who gets to decide where, you know, what housing goes, where, who gets hired, fired, what, how does the budget get uh, spent at the municipal level? And then again, if that mayor's power ultimately stems from whether or not the Ontario government agrees to give them this power. So, you know, there's a, just, there's yeah. a lot of bigger issues at play here than just, oh, you know, a couple of councillors are really ticked off at mayor. mayor well, Moore. I think, I think it's important. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important we we address the Burlington side of it and and, and the Marianne Mead Water side of it and what it mm -hmm. says about that council. But yeah, you're right. The strong mayor powers. I mean, I I said from the outset this is not when you talk about how strong mayors work. You know, prior to this, I was a fan of strong mayor powers, but this is not strong mayor powers. This is mayor in the pocket of the province powers. This is not a proper strong mayor system. A right. real strong mayor system would be based on kind of uh, something closer to how the province and the federal government works, where the, you know the mayor can kind of have their their cabinet of 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 councillors who who they delegate power to, and and you know it it's then controlled by still controlled by the kind of votes of the council. Uh, there can be rebellions. There can be whatever. The, you know the way that the strong power. You know, one of the questions that got asked during this whole debate was like, well, if if you know, if council is saying the mayor should give back the powers that were given to her, why did they vote to have those powers in the first place? And the answer is that they they didn't feel that it was actually a decision that that they were able to make because the strong mayor powers were tied to the the to major amounts of money coming from the province, tied to the targets on housing, uh, and. So, so basically it was like they didn't have the opportunity to say no we don't want strong bear powers it did happen in in new market i think we spoke oh, no, to new, mayor new, um new market mayor john taylor just refused yeah. the powers yeah it was his came decision from the mayor to do it i mean when, if you, right. when, when the mayor was was actually saying no i want these powers it's very difficult for the council to actually do anything about it because then they would have been like we're gonna overrule our councillor uh our mayor and throw millions and millions of dollars in the garbage at the same time so that's how they've got into this mess. Um, and this isn't just not how any level of government is supposed to work. If it's a real level of government and the problem with the municipalities in Canada is that they're not a real level of government. They are a sub office of the ministry of municipal affairs. This is always a problem. You know, that's how we should think about them, that they don't really have independent power. They are creatures of the province anything that they any powers that they do have can be taken away on a whim can be overruled pretty much on a whim uh they have no ability to actually make anything stick um and yeah the, the job of counselor was a sucky job before this happened i said long before that the, the um you know it, it's all it's all responsibility with no power people think they're electing a counselor to decide what gets built on the road, on the street down the road. It's not true. They have right. no power over that kind of stuff. They can vote on it. I mean, that's the ludicrous thing is they get to vote on it and then the province does what it's going to do anyway. Um, it's now an even suckier job because they're just there to, to rubber well, stamp whatever the, the mayor wants to do. And that's, um, I, I kind of want to, like, I, the reason why I, I wanted to talk about this story, you know, two or three months after the fact was I was a little pissed off the fact that we got snubbed by these counselors who are trying to make a, a point of it. There's not a lot of media in uh in in the in the area. It's why we did why we're doing this podcast. And we I think we were very fair to counselors to give them a fair shake. 
we've had them on before. They know what they're getting into. I was, this was a, a, a story of, in my opinion, great importance to Burlington and to Ontario as a whole. And, you know, if you're, if you're going to frame it with like, this is the, 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 the principles of democracy are under, uh, are, are in the crucible. I'll say this much uh, with this, with this action. Like, and the idea is that they're basically saying our job is basically nothing. Like they don't, they're, we're, you're, the Burlington taxpayer, according to these these counselors, are paying them tax tax money, thousands of dollars a year, to essentially do nothing. They, their opinion doesn't matter. Their voices don't matter. Is what they was what they were basically confiding con, con, confiding to, uh, or saying in, in this action, in my opinion. Um, the fact that you don't want to come back. We should uh, say um, we should we should say just in the, from from the. In the interest of accuracy, because otherwise we'll get caught up in it quite rightly. Mayor Meadwood did hand back some powers. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and again, you can read in the Bay Observer on the 11th of April. Uh, so she uh, she delegated power to hire a fire senior department heads to the city manager. What that kind of means is if it's delegated to the city manager, then there is... Uh, that it's not her choice. It's more the council and the corporate bodies. But choice. the city manager gets still gets chosen by the mayor. Yeah, and that the, was the big the objection. The previously, right. previously, the one person that, that, that the council could hire and fire was the city manager, and now they don't even have that. Um, and so, and the city manager, again, you know, for anybody who's not familiar with how Ontario councils work, the city manager is the equivalent of the premier or the prime minister in most ways. They're not elected, but they're the person who actually runs the city, not the mayor. The mayor's the chairman of the board um, and the councillors are, are the board members. Um, I think that's what they... this, this, you know, this is kind of the, the, the catch with the whole damn system. It's, 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 we, we think we're electing a premier and a, and a, and a cabinet and we're not. Um, it's, well, we're, think about it. If you look at any any municipality in Ontario, it's actually a corporation. It's not a body of government. It is that's why they have bylaws. They don't have laws. They have bylaws because it's a corporation. Um, which is you're right. I mean that we the mayor, councillors, whomever, we think it's a government. It's a level of governance, but it's actually you're right. More of a, a board of directors. It's the equivalent of electing a um a board for a corporation who in the city manager is the ceo or president of that corporation yeah and, and the key thing is that the city manager controls the agenda to a large extent or that the staff control the agenda so it's very difficult you know again if you think of the government who decides what laws get passed? Who who draws up the agenda of what what's going to happen? Well, the premier and his cabinet do, his or her cabinet do. Um, uh, it's the politicians who drive where the government is going, where the direction of government. Uh, in municipalities, that's not how it works. There is some limited power, more limited all the time, for councillors to say, "I'd like this to happen. I'd like you know." Uh, this to happen, mm. uh, to have the opportunity to vote on it. Uh, that's actually, even that level of influence is, is a relatively new uh, development in, in many cities. Um, basically, you know, the staff come forward and say, okay, you've got the option ABC, vote on one of them. And the ABC is down to them, not the councillors. Um, so it's very difficult in that kind of environment to actually have any kind of direction because each department decides what the ABC is. Um, well, uh, I mean, that, but again, that comes down to what, why we thought this was important to talk about, we wanted to definitely dive into it, was that any erode, we're advocates of more democracy and greater democracy, uh, especially at the municipal level. Any erosion should be, I, I, at this point, I'm like, why do we even have a council at all? Like, why, why, why this? It's why would anybody want to run to be councillor? Because it's basically you, you just get the punching bag. You get if. At the federal or provincial level, if something does go wrong, right, you go, oh, it's the municipality's fault. The 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 high rise doesn't go in; it's the municipality's fault. 
uh, a high rise is going in. It's the municipality's fault. It's it it's a way to deflect responsibility from the from the the actual powers that be. To a to a government a, a body that ultimately is neutered and, it, and quite frankly I'm gonna I'm gonna say it is a waste of taxpayer dollar like we we're paying and it's not that I'm saying Lisa Kearns Shauna Stolte Kevin Galbraith or Rory Nissan or any of them are not capable counselors they are they're very smart people they they want to do good they want to to make a difference in a positive difference in the community. But the position has just been neutered to the point where they, I don't think they can. Like it, it's a general question, like what, what are we paying them for other than just, okay, stand up, then vote, yay, nay, whatever. Like I'd be like, why even bother showing up other than I have to collect a paycheck? Yeah, these, these are people who are capable of running, yeah, like you say, the smart people capable of running a good council with, with uh, a concerted, intelligent direction and agenda they know their communities extremely well. They know, uh, the you know they're they're much better at this than the province is in terms of deciding what's good for Burlington. Now that comes with all kinds of things we know about, you know, nimbyism, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. However, properly constituted local democracy is the best democracy for the local area. Uh, yeah, we we should trust it more. Give them more power and more responsibility. Responsibility is what keeps them in check. You know, like, the, the problem is, we uh, we were talking about it the other week, you know, they mm -hmm. can vote against uh, councillors in City X, hypothetical city, can vote against a building because they know that will be popular with the voters, knowing that that building is going to be built. So vote against it. Why would you not? You'd be an idiot not to. Right. Uh, so you can, you know, encourages nimbyism, for want of a better word, because they're not actually responsible for the decision. Make them responsible. Make them so like if you don't fine, vote against that building. But if it doesn't get built, where are those people going to go? Make them make the real decision, not right. a fake decision. Um, and they will come up with good decisions. The community will come up with good decisions. We'll have a more intelligent debate about these things. And I'm not saying that. Building X in City Y should be built or shouldn't be built, but it should be real decisions, not fake decisions that that we're making. Yeah. Um. And I think you know that this is a, such a big part of the problem. Um. That there's no electoral jeopardy in voting for stupid things when it's not even a real decision. You're just playing a game. You know. It's fishy France, right? It's it's you. You you go you come up and you you oh well that's give the performance art of debating development or how we, how we want our city to grow and, and change and, and whatnot. When the decision is not really at, you, you, you don't have to own up to the, up to it. Cause if you vote against it and the province says, well, I'm bringing it in anyways, then you get to rally. I'm not, I'm how dare those, those bad, bad people at, at Queens park and people say, Oh, you're my champion for to, you know, for, the people at the ground level are going to vote for you. At the end of the day, it's all performance. It's a, it's a, it's just a theatrical act. Mm. And at the end of the day, what we need to happen doesn't happen. We, we just, we sit there and we like, oh, great, our property, uh, the housing prices are skyrocketing, and there's nothing being done to curb it because everyone's doing this song and dance, and not actually doing it like do, doing what what needs to be needs to be done um it, we i i i i guess we'll come back to, i just wish i think it's important to talk about how how do we actually do this 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 democracy how, how do we how do we engage in this on a meaningful way that people's real concerns and real thoughts are addressed um and taken into consideration the, the strong mayor's powers don't do that i don't think they they undermine democracy to, uh, totally, I really wish that the these counselors who clearly I think have the same concerns that we do wouldn't come on to to make a push of this and really make a go of this and and how have, have the 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 fortitude to stand by their convictions because this is well, this is important this is this is an important important debate to have and it, it really bothers me that when somebody stands up to the plate and uh, says I'm I'm going to 
stand up for this and you don't take a swing at the ball it's just a it's a sad state of affairs uh in our in our democracy yeah i mean some of them issued statements and so on uh, roy nissan did i think lisa kearns did as well so i mean they they, 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 they were out there to an extent but yeah i i, I would I, I'm disappointed they didn't feel that they could come on for a reason. I mean, I think there is somewhat of a culture of fear in Burlington, though, mm-hmm. where it relates to the mayor. Um, she she punishes her enemies. Um, uh, let's say metaphorically. <laughs> um, I'm not sure it is really metaphorical, but 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 something you know, if you're going to go up against the mayor, you expect. To bear the consequences, and I think, you know, to sort of come on. I can understand why you know you're more controlled issuing a statement where you control the words, and it's only you know five hundred right. words rather than a half hour conversation. I get that, but but still, I think people would, you know, well, hopefully next time they'll come on. Um, hopefully, uh, um, um, you know what? How about we call it? That we've been talking for a while, and I think people need a break. So let's let's call it <laughs> let's let's call it a let's call that a, a, an episode. Put that in the can, and uh, we will talk talk to you uh, later, folks. Have a have a great break, and we'll be back next week. Bye bye for now.